Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. In this clip, Bishop Barron is giving a homily entitled, Are We Saved by Faith Alone? Now, I find this to be a very interesting title. It makes me wonder if Bishop Barron is going to agree, at least in principle, with the Protestant doctrine. I highly doubt it, but let's see what he has to say. Peace be with you. They say fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Well, I'm going to rush in today to some uh, stormy waters by looking at what really was the central issue of the Protestant Reformation, the divide between Protestants and Catholics around this issue of faith and works or, or faith and the law. And it's prompted by our second reading. I, I've not been focusing on, on Romans. We've been reading from it the last several weeks, but it's Paul's greatest statement of his theology. It's the first theologian of the church, Paul, in his greatest statement of the Christian faith. And it's toward the end of the letter, we're in Romans chapter 13, and here's what he says. Brothers and sisters, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Hmm, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther famously says what he discovered in Paul and in texts like Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and others is it seems that we're justified or saved, set right, not by works of the law, but by faith. So Luther says by, by grace through faith, and he intensifies it by saying, gratia sola, fide sola, by grace alone, by faith alone we're saved and not by the works of the law. So how come at the end of Romans, the same Paul who said that toward the beginning of Romans, here talks about love as the fulfillment of the law. Well, again, I'm wading into these um, you know, stormy waters. We've been debating this for 500 years. I have no, uh, Ill I'm under no illusion that in 12 minutes I'm gonna solve this problem. But let me say this now, speaking as a Catholic theologian. Yes, we can find those texts in Paul, indeed, that, that seem to indicate you know, we're justified by, by faith and by grace alone, not by works. However, in the same St. Paul, we find texts such as this one today. We find a text such as, if you have faith enough to move the mountains, but have not love, you're nothing. <laughs> I don't know about you, to me that doesn't sound like I'm justified by faith alone. I mean, Paul sings the praises of faith, but, but I have faith enough to move the mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. The same Paul talks about working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Well, you'd wonder on purely Protestant grounds, if, if you've been justified by grace through faith, you've accepted the Lord as your Savior, well, what do you have to work out? And why would you do so with fear and trembling? Wouldn't you have complete, utter confidence that you're saved? Think, too, of a text like Matthew 25, go outside of St. Paul, you know, when, when the, the judge at the end of time separates the sheep from the goats. The basis of the separation is not, oh, well, some had faith and others didn't, rather, whatsoever you did to the least of my brothers, you did to me. It seems as though something like love is the criterion rather than faith. Now, my point here is not to uh, undermine those texts where Paul talks about the primacy of faith, but it, it is to complicate the matter, is to say the witness of the New Testament is richly complex. How would I get at it? I think something like this. We're justified apart from the works of the law. What does Paul mean by the law? When well, Paul's a, a Jew, he's trained in the great Israelite tradition. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He would have known all about the, uh, the complexities of Jewish law. He would have known all about temple worship. What Aquinas calls the ceremonial and juridical precepts of the law. Think here of, of again, temple sacrifice of, of priests and of of dietary laws and, and all of the particularities by which Israelite life is defined in terms of, of clothing and diet and worship and so on. None of that saves us. How come? Not because it's bad in itself, but because now it's been caught up into Christ. All of that is now seen as an anticipation of what happened through the cross of Jesus. So we're not saved by those works of the law because Christ in his dying and rising has taken all that up into himself. 
Read now the letter to the Hebrews for all the details on that point. So it seems to me that's clear in Paul, that he means we're not saved by those works. But how about the moral law of Israel? Well, Aquinas would speak for the mainstream of the Catholic tradition in saying, even though those other laws have been taken up in, into a higher synthesis, the moral law taught to Israel remains. And it is indeed relevant to our salvation. Now, look at Paul again here in 13 as he goes on. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in saying this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice, please, he's not talking about the ceremonial, dietary, juridical precepts of ancient Israel. We know that those are not relevant now to our salvation. But he's talking indeed about the moral law. The moral law, which remains. It remains in place. What he's saying here is all of that moral law is summed up in the great commandment to love. Now, let's go back to another Pauline text that Catholic theology has insisted upon. Paul, in fact, never says that we are justified by faith alone. In fact, you want to find the only time that's mentioned in the New Testament is the letter of James, and it's explicitly condemned. What does Paul, in fact, say? What matters, he says, is faith expressing itself in love. What matters is faith expressing itself in love. It seems to me that's the best summary of the complexity of Paul's position. Now, let me, let me put some more meat on the bones. A Protestant might say, well, look, aren't you defending some kind of Pelagianism here, that we're justified by our works, that's because of our, of our heroic works that we're saved? No, 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 no. There's no salvation apart from Christ. There's no salvation apart from his grace. I can't earn my way into the love of Christ. Rather, that love expressed in the cross and the resurrection, that grace is offered to me as a free gift. It's only by moving into the space of that grace that I can be saved. So no Catholic defends that I can be, I can be justified apart from faith. No, no. The Council of Trent says that faith is the beginning and root of all justification. I can't be justified apart from Christ. But now, once drawn into the power of Christ, I have through faith opened the door, invited Christ into my life. Now, his life is not extrinsic to me. And this, again, would be a Catholic critique of some forms of Protestantism. That justification remains extrinsic to me. It's a mere forensic declaration of righteousness, not a real righteousness. An imputed righteousness. It's as though I'm saved. The Catholic tradition, following, I think, the complexity of Paul, has insisted, no, no, justification now, through my cooperation, works its way into the whole of my life. Again, the Council of Trent says, justification that begins through faith increases through one's cooperation with grace. Paul says, it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. Now, see, that's the whole picture right there, everybody. That's the whole picture. It's no longer I, this old self you know, predicated upon self-protection and upon hatred and upon violence. And th that old self has been put away by grace, accepted in faith. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who truly lives in me. And what does that look like? Love. <laughs> it looks like love. It expresses itself as love. The commandments, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't covet, all of it is summed up by saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, you say, well, all right, aren't we back to Pelagianism? Like, it's by love that we're, we're saved. 
love. And I, you know, if you follow me, I've taught this for years. Love is not a feeling. It's not just a benevolence, not just a, a sentiment. To love is to will the good of the other as other. Can you do that apart from grace? I think the answer is no. You know, go back to the ancient moral philosophers. They talk about, you know, decency and magnanimity and generosity, that sort of thing. But willing the good of the other as other, this ecstatic moving outside of the confines of one's ego. Yes, even to the point of death. You don't find that in the ancient moral philosophers. What makes real love possible? Grace. It's only when I, through faith, open the door to Christ and allow him to begin living in me that I begin to live according to his mind. Remember, Paul says, may that same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. I begin to will with his will. I begin to move and act and react according to him. This is not just Christ as moral exemplar. It's Christ living in me. This has happened not by my accomplishment, but by grace accepted in faith. To that degree, Luther's right. But this is not a mere imputed or forensic righteousness, a merely declared righteousness. But rather, it has taken root in me. And through my cooperation, expresses itself as something entirely new and strange. It expresses itself as love. You know, I often go back to um, the great example of Maximilian Kolbe when I think about this. Kolbe, as you know, who, who gave his life for a man he barely knew. He was a fellow inmate in the, in the uh, prison at Auschwitz. But at the moment of truth, Kolbe said, take me in his place. I mean, how do you explain that? Always being very generous. I mean, it doesn't come close to explaining it. I would say you explain it by saying it was no longer no longer Kolbe who lived, but Christ who was living in him. Kolbe had accepted Christ and his grace through faith. Yep, that's the door to the spiritual life, as Aquinas says. But then allowing that Christ to come to full flower in him, it looked like love, willing the good of the other. So how are we saved? By faith, yeah. Accepting the grace of Christ, absolutely. Without that, we can't be saved. But that's the door. That's the beginning. That's the root. This faith now, having taken root, expresses itself in this startling love. It seems to me, everybody, that's the Catholic position. And as far as I can tell, honors the richness and complexity of the teaching we find in Paul. Take a look during these, uh, these summer weeks. Read through Paul to the Romans, and perhaps with this very issue in mind, and notice the rich complexity of his thought. And God bless you. found that to be a very interesting take, um, and there's just a few things that I would want to say. The first thing is I want to bring to the forefront here this phrase, faith expressing itself in love. In Protestant theology, there is this phrase, ordo salutis, which basically talks about the order of salvation. And this terminology, I think, is very helpful because when we're talking about salvation, at least in the debates between Protestantism and Catholicism, it's really an issue of order of importance more than anything. It's an issue of what comes first. And I think that uh, Bishop Barron here brilliantly explains the nuances, as he put it, the richness and complexity uh, of this position. Listening to him, I don't think there's much to that either of the sides would disagree with. I think that fundamentally in the Protestant Reformation and their ways of understanding soteriology, there would have been an emphasis on ju justification in this 
in the sense of imputation that Bishop Barron is disagreeing with. But even in this understanding of imputation, it would have led to, let's say, the fruits of that faith. It would have it would lead to faith expressing itself in love. So I actually think that that is a good way to not only summarize, you know, historically what has been believed um, about salvation, but also I think that actually makes a lot of sense of what the Protestant reformers were saying. Now, with that being said, there is technical language that is different, um, that is explained differently um, than in, it's explained differently. So for example, these contrasting terms of imputation and impartation, the, the theological terminology for the Protestants is this idea of imputation. It's this idea that there is a declaration that you are made righteous by God apart from yourself. Now, impartation, which is seen in, in many different Protestant circles as well, as Bishop Barron mentions, for example, Wesleyan Arminian theology likes the term impartation. Uh, my dad is an evangelical pastor in this tradition, and he would use the term impartation over and against imputation. Uh, and impartation is really just kind of this idea, this seed idea that Bishop Barron was talking about, that you're actually in Christ and his righteousness is actually imparted to you, not just imputed to you, and it's going to produce fruit. Um, and so what it really comes back down to is um, Martin Luther has this phrase, simul justus et peccador. It's this idea that simultaneously you're just and sinner at the same time. Whereas I think the Catholic position is that you are made just and the sin is uprooted from you. Um, I'm reading a very big tome on justification from the Protestant perspective. And the author, Dr. Michael Horton, is a very, very staunch, reformed, law and gospel distinction type theologian. So basically, he would be the complete opposite of what uh, Bishop Barron is saying here. But... He's doing a very good researchable job of going through some of the historical um, treatises on justification. And this was his conclusion of the early church fathers. The distinct role of justification in the order salutis, namely the imputation of Christ's righteousness rather than impartation of inherent righteousness, though not denied, does not seem even to have occurred to these formative theologians of the early uh, medieval period. So I guess it would be a little bit after the church fathers uh, into the 400, 500s or whatever um, era that was precisely. But notice what he's saying. He's saying a lot of what, a lot like what Bishop Barron is saying. He's basically saying this idea, you can find it in Paul, this idea of being just justified by faith alone. But the reality is, is that it's not the only thing that is said. It, it's almost as if they're saying two things at the same time. They're saying it is that, but also that it's not that. And I think what that shows fundamentally is that this reality of justification by faith alone is really rooted in um, cultural, the cultural milieu of the Reformation. And it comes to light not because of what the biblical text says, but ultimately because there was differing factors that was um, creating this, this, it was as if this, this theological position was being illuminated because of different cultural factors. I think that's the best way to think about it. All right, again, Bishop Barron is just so eloquent and he walks the fine line. This was a very, very fascinating look, especially for me coming from a Protestant position on how he would talk about, um, obviously, the, this idea of sola fide, this idea that we're saved by faith alone. It's a very, very, you know, it's like the main, it's the hallmark theological doctrine of the Protestant um, theological position. It was really interesting to hear what he had to say. All right, that's all I have for this video. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.